that were surrounding Vicksburg. Tonight, we will be discussing the surrender interview that takes place. It's not just the surrender interview that is encompassing uh, the surrender of Vicksburg. Uh, it was a pretty lengthy process. And uh, so we're going to get into that. Uh, I'll make it kind of quick because uh, David Slay is going to do his program on the occupation and reconstruction, and that's going to be a little bit longer than the surrender. So, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the surrender, uh, when it's unfolding between uh, Lieutenant General John C. Pemberton and uh, Major General Ulysses S. Grant, Pemberton is trying to communicate with Joseph E. Johnston. And you have to remember in our latter discussion with uh, Grant having cut in the telegraph lines, communication between Johnston and Pemberton is through courier. And that is a timely process. It will take at least four, perhaps five, maybe even longer days to get messages from Vicksburg to Jackson. And so keep that in mind when we're discussing some of these uh, transactions between Pemberton and Johnson. <clears throat> now, uh, the drawing here, the sketch here, is probably one of the most famous, uh, was in Harper's Weekly, of Pemberton and Grant discussing the surrender terms. We're going to get into that right now. So on June 20th, uh, Pemberton receives a message from uh, General uh, Johnston requesting him to suggest a plan whereby his army could break out of Vicksburg. Ideally, Johnston still wants Pemberton to come and join his forces. Um, June 23rd, Pemberton writes to Johnston suggesting that he propose to grant conditions for the surrender of Vicksburg. On July the 1st, uh, Pemberton will send uh, a message to his four division commanders. He wants their uh, input and their ideas or views, if you will, on the condition of their troops and their ability, as he is quoted as saying, to make the marches and undergo the fatigues necessary to accomplish a successful evacuation. Now, upon the receipt of the message, the division commanders, of course, are going to refer to their brigade commanders. Now, Major General Carter L. Stevenson, who is Pemberton's senior division commander, had uh, only one of his four brigade commanders, and that would be Brigadier General Stephen D. Lee, think that his unit, equal to undergoing the fatigue which would be incident to our evacuation of the city. So Stevenson will inform Pemberton on July the 2nd that his men were much too enfeebled but that rather than be captured, they would exert themselves to the utmost to accomplish an evacuation. Now, both of Major General John Forney's brigade commanders, that would be Brigadier General John C. Moore and Brigadier General Louis Hebert, stated that their troops were in no condition to attempt a breakout. Now, uh, Forney would write to Pemberton and say, I have to state that I concur in the unanimous opinion of the brigade and regimental commanders, that the physical condition and health of our men are not sufficiently good to be enabled to accomplish successfully the evacuation. The spirit of the men is still, however, unshaken. I am satisfied that we'll cheerfully continue to bear the fatigues and privations of the siege. I don't know if I would really be uh, cheerfully engaging in fatigues and privations of a siege at this moment. However, uh, after conferring with his uh, brigade commanders, Major General Martin Luther Smith uh, answered Pemberton, while under the impression that the troops will today resist an assault as substantially or perhaps more so as when they first manned the trenches, I do not think they would do as well out of them and in the field. And he's probably right. You've got to remember these men have been in these trenches. They have not had leave from those trenches. They've been basically uh, in the same positions along the Confederate defensive line, wherever their regiment was positioned, uh, in the same clothes, 
Um, again, by this point of the siege, we saw that the men had been rationed down to a quarter cup of water per day per man, a handful of peas, of peas and rice per man. Uh, they had been reduced to uh, uh, killing the mules and cooking the mule meat. So th these men were certainly really not capable of doing much. Uh, Smith would also go on to tell Pemberton that uh, if Johnston did not raise the siege, he deemed it best to propose terms of capitulation before forced to do so from want of provisions. Major General John Bowen, uh, and this would be uh, Pemberton's junior division commander, but probably one of his more capable uh, it is replies in the negative. He felt that his Missourians and Arkansans uh, could not give battle and march over 10 or 12 miles in the same day. And as we discussed last week, the idea was to march south along the Warrington Road uh, to try to make it to the Big Black, uh, across the Big Black, putting that uh, obstacle between the Confederate Army and General Grant. The thing to consider, though, is you do have Admiral David Dixon Porter's Western Flotilla. The gunboats uh, are going to be positioned very easily there along the Big Black to act as a bottleneck to really stop that Confederate advance. So, uh, on July the 2nd, Pemberton had received the reports of his division commanders, of which three of the four stated their troops were unable to attempt a breakout. And two of the four even went as so far to recommend surrender. On the evening of the 2nd, Pemberton will convene a council of war uh, with, at his headquarters, <coughs> Cowan House on Crawford Street. And again, his division commanders advised him to surrender his army and the city. He would uh, ask them verbatim, man for man, what they thought they would give their reply. Pemberton proposed a letter dated the 3rd and addressed it to uh, Major General Ulysses S. Grant. He proposed that they appoint a three commissioners uh, commission to come up with terms for the surrender. Pemberton would uh, let Bowen deliver it to Grant. Bowen was uh, very familiar with Grant, having lived in Missouri for a while at the same time Grant had. Now, on July the 3rd, at about 10 a.m., Major General Bowen, uh, dressed in full uniform, of course, all the regalia with the uh, pomp and circumstance that a, a dress uniform would, would allow, and Lieutenant Colonel Thomas M. Montgomery of uh, Pemberton's staff uh, would appear on the Baldwin Ferry Road, just right out here in front of the visitor center, pretty much, in front of the 2nd Texas Lunette. Uh, as they passed beyond the Confederate uh, picket line, they started to be fired upon. And it wasn't really us until Bowen had looked over at Montgomery. Montgomery had forgot to unfurl the white flag of truce. So, you know, he kind of looks at Bowen, and uh, Bowen looks at Montgomery and says, you know, hey, you might want to uh, unfurl that flag so we don't get shot. <laughs> kind of deal. Uh, once that appears, the, they make it to uh, the Union lines. Uh, they were being fired upon by men of uh, Stephen G. Burbridge's brigade, which were positioned in their uh, Union rifle trenches fronting the Second Texas Lunette. Uh, the first bust that you come to uh, as you go through the park, uh, into the park tool road, through the arch, will be that of uh, Brigadier General Stephen Burbridge. And that really does mark his position, his campsite, if you will, uh, during the siege. Uh, the two officers were blindfolded and they were taken to a tent uh, belonging to one of Burbridge's staff officers. Uh, Burbridge was ill at the time and could not see him. But now what we will see here uh, in just a second is that uh, a drawing, a sketch if you will, by Theodore Davis, who is the primary sketch artist uh, for Harper's Weekly during the Vicksburg campaign. Most of the, what you see in Harper's Weekly comes from Davis. Uh, is contrary to what the what was in the ORs, the official records. So, 10th Division Commander Brigadier General Andrew J. Smith, who is Burbage's commanding officer in, in his division, arrived uh, and Bowen requested to see Grant, thinking that 
Since he and Grant were friends, then they knew each other that he would be able to see him. Grant refuses the request because he is only a division commander. He wants to meet with Pemberton. Well, he won't meet with none other than Pemberton. Uh, Bowen will ask Grant if he would consider a meeting with Pemberton, and Grant uh, does agree, and that if Pemberton wanted a meeting, he should display a white flag at some place along the Confederate lines. And before leaving, Bowen will designate the point uh, where the Jackson Road passes through the Confederate lines as the place the white flag would be raised at 3 p.m. This is uh, Theodore Davis's sketch. Uh, apparently this, I, I assume this would be Burbridge because he was ill, he's in his cot as you can see. Uh, they would have taken him uh, to the ranking officer's uh, location uh, when they would have come out of the lines. You eventually move up the ranks, of course. Uh, so, again, sketched by Theodore Davis in uh, Harper's Weekly on August 1st, 1863. Will. Yes. Just to say real quick that Bowen was remarkable that he was there, that he was dying. He was, he was, actually, I was going to mention that in just a minute. Okay, uh, the, he is on the, uh, he, he is right now at the onset of the early stages of dysentery. He is capable of conducting these uh, orders and, and doing these things right here, but he is a very weak man. Eventually, uh, Bowen will die from dysentery on July the 13th, uh, so just uh, 11 days after the, after the siege, after the surrender uh, from dysentery, which goes to show you that dysentery just, it, it wasn't a private's disease, it wasn't an enlisted man's disease, even these high-ranking officers uh, suffered from that disease as well. <coughs> So uh, Bowen and Montgomery uh, do return to Pemberton's Cowan House headquarters with a dispatch from Grant. Grant does not agree to the three commissioner panel and will only accept unconditional surrender. Uh, after all, he is, nickname is Unconditional Surrender Grant, right? Uh, Pemberton, uh, but he, he is assured that Pemberton's men uh, who had sown so much endurance and courage would be treated with all the respect due prisoners of war. Pemberton will tell Bowen that he would not surrender unconditionally, at which point Bowen tells him Grant desired a meeting if he were so inclined. And this is where it's going to get fun. Bowen then tells Pemberton Grant would meet at 3 o'clock between the lines, and after conferring with his division commanders, uh, Pemberton agrees. So on July the 3rd at 3 o'clock, Pemberton, Bowen, Montgomery, all arrive at the Jackson Road. Montgomery carried the white flag, and this time he did on a <laughs> Now, met by Generals Grant, Ord, McPherson, Logan, and A.J. Smith, uh, with several of Grant's staff officers, um, they arrived a little bit earlier and, to get set up uh, and were resting under the shade of an oak tree. Uh, today, the oak tree that is next to the Surrender Monument, of course, is not the same oak tree. <laughs> Bowen formally introduces the two commanders, even though they served together in the Mexican War under Major General William Worth's division, and uh, they were acquainted somewhat. But the thing about it is Bowen and McPherson actually graduated West Point together in 1853, so they had a, uh, a common bond, common friendship, if you will, uh, Grant, in kind of hopes of lightening the mood, had brought him a uh, demijohn. Of course, you can imagine what was in it. Now, uh, Pemberton, uh, and here's a, uh, another sketch of the, the surrender interview, uh, one that shows both Grant and Pemberton and the officers, as you can see, kind of standing uh, beside each other. Uh, this one is a relatively new sketch, though. Uh, saw it on uh, a website, MS News, not MS News now, but MSNews.com, something like that. 
Another uh, one of the surrender interviews. Again, uh, you can see the uh, oak tree. Uh, two generals uh, sitting with their officers. Uh, Montgomery here with the fly, fly flag unfurled. Thank goodness. Uh, the officers again uh, uh, meeting around and, and talking with each other. So Pemberton, thinking that Grant had called uh, for the meeting, states, it has been my understanding that you have expressed a wish to have a personal interview. <laughs> ah, but this is where it gets fun. Uh, Grant replies that he was most certainly not the one to call for the meeting. And Pemberton states, there is a misunderstanding. I have certainly understood differently. To which Bowen has to step in and kind of set the stage like, well, actually, what happened was... I told the general you would meet with him. Pemberton will ask Grant, uh, in your letter this morning, you state that uh, you have no other terms than an unconditional surrender. And Grant says, I have no other. Pemberton Dennis says, then, sir, it is unnecessary that we, that you and I should hold any further conversation. We will go on to fighting at once. Pemberton adds, I can assure you, sir, you will bury many more of your men before you will enter Vicksburg. Pemberton states he has enough provisions to hold out indefinitely. Grant is to the wiser. Uh, you have to realize that some of these Confederate soldiers have been uh, deserting on on mass in some cases, and they have been letting the federal the federal counterparts know that uh, what the situation is like in in Vicksburg and along the Confederate defenses. So Grant proposed that the two step aside and let their subordinates hash out the details that might result in better terms for uh, surrender for the Confederate garrison. Uh, McPherson, A.J. Smith, Bowen, and Montgomery uh, will discuss the matter of surrender. Uh, while Grant and Pemberton uh, will talk about other things not related to the surrender, things like their service in the Mexican War and whatnot, Owen is going to suggest that the Confederate Army be allowed to march out of Vicksburg carrying all their small arms and their field artillery pieces. Let's do it. All right. The Federal Army would then march in and take control of the city and siege and the siege guns, small arms, uh, not in possession by the rebel soldiers, uh, the Federal would occupy. Of course, uh, Grant is going to reject this. You're not going to let any surrendering army take their arms. Uh, Pemberton reminding Grant that he had rejected the commission, that it was now up to him to come up with terms for surrender. Grant agrees and tells the Confederate officers that he will have his decision for them by 10 p.m. Pemberton and Grant would both confer with their division and brigade commanders before an agreement, of course, is going to be reached. Upon their departure, the two generals would agree that hostilities would not be renewed unless negotiations were broken off. Thus, Union and Confederate soldiers wandered about between the lines, particularly along the Jackson Road area. And one Union private recalled that several brothers met and any quantity of cousins. It was a strange scene. Grant will summon a staff meeting with all corps and division commanders and will listen to proposals that they may offer but that he will make any final decision. Grant would later state that this was the closest attempt to a council of war that he has ever held. Now, Grant's core division commanders will advise Grant that it would really be in the better interest of the Army of the Tennessee to parole the Vicksburg garrison in accordance with the Dix Hill Cartel of 1862. The Dix Hill Cartel was an agreement uh, held on July 22nd of 1862 between Union and Confederate government as to how to handle the general exchange of prisoners of war. The negotiators were Union Major General John A. Dix and Confederate Major General Daniel Harvey Hill. Now the agreement named two locations for the exchange to occur, one at A.M. Aiken's Landing uh, below Dutch Gap, and that's in Virginia, and the other is here at Vicksburg. Now the cartel agreement established an exchange of military officers and enlisted personnel. Personnel of equal ranks would transfer man for man, private for private, sergeant for sergeant, lieutenant for lieutenant, etc. 
while a system of scale of equivalence was in place to handle exchange of officers to enlisted personnel. An example of this is that a general was worth 60 privates. I imagine that did cause some consternation amongst privates. Uh, this parole would allow Grant to use the transports to move the Army of the Tennessee onto other campaigns. Every general knows that to continue to uh, be successful, you have to press the fight. Uh, Grant is realizing this in his Western theater operations. Eventually he'll do this the same in the Eastern. Uh, unlike uh, the generals that were uh, serving the Union in the East, McClellan and uh, Burnside, who really kind of sit idle, if you will, uh, Grant is, knows that he has to continually uh, engage the enemy. And if he was stuck here, at Vicksburg, using the Army of the Tennessee as prisoner of war guards, and he is not doing that. And so, really, it does come down to Grant's subordinates, as well as conversation with Admiral David Dixon Porter, that uh, he will parole the Vicksburg garrison. Uh, he would have to use up all those transports that he could use to then transport the Army of the Tennessee. He would have to use them to transport these Confederate soldiers up the Mississippi River to places like Cairo, where they will have to then board trains to be shipped into uh, the northern states to prison of war camps. Now, Grant will also remember the difficulty that he has with the uh, prisoners that he captured at Fort Donaldson. And this is going to play in, into that factor. Uh, Admiral Porter will also mention that he really does not have the transports uh, necessary to, to move 30,000 Confederates, uh, a process that would take nearly four months. You know, having an army sit for four months is really not ideal. Grant's proposal is to take possession of Vicksburg uh, the next morning, on July the 4th, and have muster rolls made out for every Confederate officer and enlisted soldier, and then have them sign a parole. After the paroles were signed, the rank and file were to march out with nothing but their clothes and take no property. Officers were allowed to keep their sidearm and one horse. Any rations that could be mustered from the Confederate was to be placed on 30 wagons, and this would save the federal government the trouble of transporting and feeding the prisoners before their exchange. And this is where it will be interesting. The rations that were stored in the Vicksburg Commissary at the time of the surrender included over 38,000 pounds of bacon, which would make 76,000 rations, uh, 427 pounds of salt pork, 5,000 bushels of peas, 51,000 pounds of rice, 92,000 pounds of sugar, 3,240 pounds of soap, which I'm sure was desperately needed. Uh, there was no flour. The flour had been reserved to uh, the hospitals uh, for the men that were uh, of the sickest nature, uh, trying to get them uh, somewhat better. Uh, so the flour had not been issued to the men in the uh, defenses and then 428,000 pounds of salt. This is all in the Vicksburg Commissary. What Pemberton was doing was hoping to hold this back for a breakout so that he could take this with him to be able to feed the army uh, had they uh, made that breakout. Grant called upon his chiefs of artillery from each corps to have their cannons fire a 34-gun salute from each battery, not each piece. Keep that in mind because if that were the case, it would be about a 220 gun salute. Uh, we're all positioned along the siege lines at 5 a.m. in honor of the 87th anniversary of Independence Day. Now, July the 3rd at 10 p.m., <coughs> Pemberton will receive Grant's proposal for surrender. After reading the letter uh, to his officers, he asked each for their input 
beginning with the junior officers, all voted to surrender but two, Brigadier General William E. Baldwin and Brigadier General Stephen D. Lee. Baldwin noted, I object to surrender of the troops, and I am in favor of holding position or attempting to do so as long as possible. Lee would go on to say, I do not think it is time to surrender in this, this garrison and post yet, nor do I think it practical to cut our way out. When it is time to surrender, the terms proposed by Grant are as good as we can expect. Remember to address his officers, saying, Well, gentlemen, I have heard your votes and I agree with your almost unanimous decision. Though my own preference would be to put myself at the head of my troops and make a desperate effort to cut our way through the enemy. That is my only hope of saving myself from shame and disgrace. Far better it would be for me to die at the head of my army, even vain effort to force the enemy's lines than to surrender it and live and be met the obloquy which I know will be heaped upon me. But my duty is to sacrifice myself to save the army which has so nobly done its duty to defend Vicksburg. I therefore concur with you and shall offer to surrender the army on the 4th of July. Now, some of Pemberton's officers objected to the surrender on the 4th, but Pemberton will reply, I know my people, meaning the North, because he is from Philadelphia. They are a vain, glorious, and egotistical lot. They will give anything if the city were to be surrendered on the great national holiday of July the 4th. Pemberton, having decided to surrender, drafted his reply to Grant. He offers a couple of counter-proposals. One, he does want his army to be allowed to march out at 10 a.m. on the 4th with its colors and its arms. Again, 19th uh, century uh, warfare, the capture the flag type uh, mentality. The flag is of, of utmost respect for these men, so they want to hand it over with honor. Uh, he will also ask that the rights and property of citizens be respected. Now he's going to turn to Major General Martin Luther Smith to deliver uh, the letter to Grant, and he will arrive well after midnight. Grant is still up in his tent, and as well, uh, Grant's son Fred, who was also in the tent, will remember uh, when Grant reads the letter saying, he gave a sigh of relief and said, Vicksburg has surrendered. Grant composed his answer, and though he refused to make any stipulations uh, regarding the civilians of Vicksburg, he would allow the garrison to march out with their colors. But after their arms were stacked and the soldiers were to be marched back inside the perimeter where they would remain until they were paroled, uh, uh, Pemberton was told that if he did not recognize these terms by 9 a.m., they would be regarded as rejected and hostilities would resume. Pemberton acceded to the amended surrender terms and his letter of acceptance reached Grant about dawn. Grant will then uh, relay to his Corps Chiefs uh, of Artillery to really load their pieces with blank cartridges uh, when firing the 34-gun salute. He's also going to have communications with Admiral David Dixon Porter. Uh, so let's face it, if you do not let the Navy know what you're doing and all of a sudden they hear 34 guns going off, they're going to think something's up, so they might try to do the same. However, you do not want that when the city is surrendering. So they will let Admiral David Por uh, Dixon Porter know uh, that the Confederates would surrender at 10 a.m. and the firing that they would be hearing is the 34-gun national salute. So at 10 a.m., the white flag was displayed and the Confederates marched out. In an order by their officers, the soldiers halted, dressed ranks, stacked arms, laid their colors on the stacks. Next, the soldiers would remove their knapsacks, belts, cartridge boxes, cap pouches, placing them on the ground, and then they returned to their camps. And again, another uh, of Theodore Davis' the sketches of the surrender in uh, Harper's Weekly. You can see here the Confederates lined up in the trenches, the flag uh, stacked on the arms, uh, federal troops getting ready to take control, uh, take possession of the uh, Confederate works. This is a still uh, from our movie, Here Brother Spalt, 
And again, showing you how they would have stacked the arms, placing the colors across the stacked arms, uh, and then removing all their accoutrements, uh, cartridge boxes, cap pouches, uh, etc. The tally of captured Confederate arsenal at Vicksburg will result in 172 pieces of artillery. 103 field pieces and 69 siege guns. Of the field pieces, you had 50 smooth bore, 31 rifled, and 22 howitzers. Of the siege guns, you had 46 smooth bore, 21 rifled, one howitzer, and one mortar. 38,000 projectiles, which of mostly of those were fixed. 58,000 pounds of black powder. 4,800 artillery cartridges. 50,000 shoulder weapons were retrieved. And of that, uh, nearly 30,000 of those are the 577 caliber infield rifle, one of the most desired weapons uh, during the American Civil War. We would have had 600,000 rounds of ammunition retrieved and another 350,000 percussion caps. Quite a capture. On July the 10th, the Army of Vicksburg, numbering around 29,491 that had signed or refused parole, was now ready to leave Vicksburg. So in the end, 709 refused to sign the parole and were thus transported north to Union prisoner of war camps. There were also about 3,600 Confederates that were still confined to the hospitals. Major General Martin Luther Smith was to remain uh, behind to issue the furloughs to the sick and disabled uh, Confederates as soon as they were capable of travel. Uh, Grant will agree to this. He will also allow um, Major General Smith to have a contingent of uh, orderlies to, to help him conduct this. this <coughs> July the 11th at 4 a.m., all Confederate soldiers that had signed the paroles were fit for duty, began to march out of the Confederate defenses, with the exception of Major General Carter Stevenson's division, which ends up leaving on July the 12th. Now, as soon as the Confederate column departs the Vicksburg perimeter, well, these Confederates don't have any arms. So many of these men, knowing that, will decide that they had had enough. They're going home. I probably would too after 47 days of the siege. Now, on July the 14th, Pemberton will establish his headquarters at Brandon, and he would wire President Davis and request permission to grant 30-day furloughs to his men. At uh, Brandon, Pemberton learns that he, all of the division commanders, and the brigade commanders, and the Mississippi State troops had been declared exchanged on July the 13th. Stevenson and Bowen's division will be held at two parole camps, one at Enterprise, Mississippi, which is just south of Meridian, the other across the state line at Demopolis, Alabama, uh, of which they are all declared officially exchanged at the end of September, 1863. Now, one of the things that you will see uh, in some of the official reports and letters and and things of that nature. One will come to light uh, as a report from Colonel Ashbell Smith. He was the <laughs> Colonel of the 2nd Texas Infantry. He uh, was part of Brigadier General John C. Moore's Brigade of Forney's Division. This is just one sentence. That's why it's all up there. You can't really take out a section of a quote of just a... Uh, but that is one sentence, very Faulkner-esque, I would say. Up to the last moment of the siege, the men bore with unripening cheerfulness and undaunted spirit the fatigues of almost continual position under arms, of frequent working parties by day and night, the broiling of the midday sun and summer with no shelter, the chilling night dews, the cramped inaction at all times in the trenches, short rations, at times drenched with rain and bivouacking in the mud, together with the discomforts inseparable from their having no change of clothing and insufficient supply of water for cleanliness. Tired, ragged, dirty, 
barefoot, hungry, covered with vermin, with a scanty supply of ammunition, almost hand to hand with the enemy and beleaguered on every side, with no prospect and little hope of relief when I think of their cheerfulness and buoyant courage under these circumstances, <coughs> the alacrity with which they performed every duty, it appears to me no commendation of these soldiers can be too great. So some of the commanders, I think, might have thought a little differently, and I'm sure some of the privates and soldiers and the enlisted men themselves thought. Uh, but many of the men, and as, as you, we discussed last week, uh, the letter that Pemberton received uh, declaring that if you cannot feed us, you better surrender us, it probably states how most of the men felt. So what you'll find is, uh, after the surrender, uh, men will, will place monuments uh, on these battlefields. This is one of the earliest known photographs of the surrender interview uh, monument. Uh, notice that it will have the cannonball atop. Uh, this monument is actually, uh, was confiscated, it was actually meant for a, a a headstone, a mar marker for a uh, person that was going to be, be buried. The Federals confiscated it. Uh, here it is today. It is just right outside the uh, auditorium here in the visitor center. Notice the cannonball is missing. As well, you'll notice chips have been taken out of it. And that is because, you know, soldiers would come back <coughs> and take out pocket knives and try to carve some of it off. And you can actually see a couple of spots uh, where knife blades are broken off in that marble. Now, the uh, monument was at the surrender site location uh, from 1864 to 1867. It's one of the very first monuments ever placed on a battlefield. Uh, the monument does become heavily damaged uh, due to relic hunters and, and vandalism. So it was moved from that location and placed at the Indian Mound in the National Cemetery. But it was still somewhat in danger, so it was removed in 1940 and placed in storage uh, when it was uh, brought out in 1988 for the 125th anniversary of the, uh, of the Battle of Vicksburg campaign. Uh, and of course it is now on display in the Visitor Center. Here the monument is on top of the Indian Mound. Uh, these are Union veterans that had come back to place uh, decorating the occasion for, of Union soldiers' graves. Right back here is Fort Hill. At that point, it does still have the cannonball on the top. When it was removed, a 42-pound cannon was uh, in its place. And this is a postcard from 1900. Uh, look at the uh, area around it. You can certainly see how the topography was still the same, but the view is, is a much different. Uh, and this cannon stayed here from 1867 to 1940, uh, and then it was returned back to the park in 1990. I believe, uh, Rick, I might, uh, it was a swap with a cannon exchange with Fort Sumter. Somehow Fort Sumter ended up with it, and we had an exchange with uh, Fort Sumter to get it back uh, here. It was originally supposed to be scrapped uh, for the metal drive for World War II and it never made it there. Somehow it made it to Fort Sumter and uh, according to the, the article in the newspaper, uh, I guess the Vicksburg Post, some visitor just happened to notice the, the inscription, on. something, the shadow of it because it had been painted over so many times and park staff started looking at it and realized what it was and <coughs> got returned here in uh, Another photograph, uh, this is the uh, Fort Ladder, uh, 19th century, 1899 perhaps, early 1900s. Uh, again, you can see the uh, original cannon here. A view of uh, the surrender interview site, early 20th century. Uh, this would of course be Pemberton Avenue. Of course, before 1937, because the old visitor center, old superintendent's quarters right about here is not 
has not been built yet. This is a, from the Cooper Postcard Collection. Uh, with outstretched hands, Honorable J.C. Pemberton III and Colonel U.S. Grant III met May 22, 1937 at the scene of the interview between their grandfathers July 3, 1863, where the terms were arranged for the surrender of Vicksburg. Again, uh, the original canon. Well, that will conclude the surrender part. I will certainly take any questions anybody might have. Well, what's the significance of the 34 Dunn salute? What was the 34? 34. 34 states that were uh, comprised the United States, which does include the Confederate states at the time of the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, you will go to 35 states uh, with in uh, 1864 is when you'll get the 35th state. Yes, sir. So after the Confederate soldiers were paroled in these camps in Meridian, some of them were then free to join, rejoin the uh, Confederate Army? Once, once you are declared officially exchanged, then you are certainly allowed to continue to uh, pick up arms and, and continue to fight. Now, the men that were still in the hospitals, they, they stayed for just a little while. Uh, they stayed till probably uh, about the mid-August or so is when they were, ma majority of them were furloughed. And of course, they would have just gone on home. Uh, you'll see that the men of the trans-Mississippi states, that would be Arkansas, Texas, uh, the portions of Louisiana that are west of the Mississippi River, will have to go to uh, Arkansas, Win Winsboro, Arkansas, uh, to a parole camp there to be remustered into their regiments. And you would see that these men would be, uh, the regiments themselves would send out a sergeant and a lieutenant from each regiment, uh, more than that, you know, probably a couple from each company to try and round up these men. Because when you go to that company level in, within the regiment, that's where these men come from the same towns, from the same county. They know each other. They could be brothers. They could be cousins. They could be best friends. And so they know one another. And when you go back to that community looking for these men, saying, hey, we've been declared exchange. It's now time for you to come back and join uh, the Army. And, 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 Continue to, continue to fight. Uh, you will also see, though, some of these men that are pretty hardcore will just go ahead and immediately go and find another regiment to, to join. And some of these men actually are at Chickamauga and uh, Chattanooga. They're uh, at the time of that, that battle in September of 1863. And another point on the question I asked, it was two weeks ago, about the Confederate uh, enlisted man or officer that was sent a messenger to General Johnson just before the day before the, the battle and, and according to the speaker visited General Grant's camp there. I looked at the uh, internet and uh, in General Grant's uh, memoirs and General Johnson had a dispatch of that day where he said there was a Lieutenant Saunders who was sent as a messenger. And then in the internet, we have Lieutenant Saunders being a Union officer in the Battle of Chickasaw Bluff used as a messenger between the Confederate and Union armies in the earlier battle here. So you have a contradiction there, but if you go into Grant's memoirs, you find the mention of an officer cashiered from the Union Army in Memphis a couple of months before the battle which could have been this same Saunders who had been switched, had been cashiered out of the Union Army for complaining. And uh, then uh, it somehow is taken up by the Confederates in Vicksburg and then gets sent as a messenger uh, to General Johnson. That's just a thought. I don't know. That, that was all part of the ruse to get him in uh, as a spy. 
So Grant was using him as a spy. That's he correct. said he was cashiered in order that's to correct. trick. Well, that's what I thought would be possible. That's correct. That's interesting. Yes. <coughs> if a soldier opted out and didn't want to rejoin a regiment, was he considered a deserter? That would be the case, sir. Yes, sir. And arrested? Uh, you, he would have been sought after, and uh, he would have first been forced into the regiment. Uh, of course, if, if he tries to run, uh, perhaps they, they will take some extensive measures to make sure that he doesn't do that again. Uh, you know, it, it, it does happen. Uh, at first, though, they do want to make sure that these men do go and rejoin these regiments. Uh, but actions are taken, uh, sometimes use of deadly force, uh, that does occur. But they do want these men to come and rejoin these regiments uh, and will, it, they will handcuff them if they have to, uh, all time, whatever, to try and, and bring them forcefully. And then, of course, if they do try to, to run again, then other measures are taken. If they are captured, then yes, they would be hung. That's correct, ma'am. Until they are declared officially exchanged, and the <coughs> Vicksburg garrison is declared officially exchanged at the end of September of 1863, which means that these men will then go and join the uh, Confederate Army of Tennessee and fight uh, at the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain and the campaign. Etc. Of course, many of those men will also again get recaptured. Yes, sir. I can't get rid of the strange question. Why such so many hundred thousand pounds of salt or rations of salt transfer into so few rations? Those under eight hundred. <clears throat> that is a good question. Uh, I think the salt would have been used uh, primarily as a preservative, uh, first and foremost. Uh, you would have then seen uh, that's just what's, that's what was in the official records. I, I'm not for sure. You know, they uh, could have very easily have been <coughs> holding some of that salt out for other purposes rather than rationing it to the men. Uh, like you know, salt is the is the preservative of, of the time period because of no refrigeration, and so I would assume that would be the case. Well, it doesn't look like the unit is the ration there. It really doesn't. Uh, again, that's what is in the ORs. So whenever John C. Pemberton said that he did have these have supplies, in fact he did. It's just the soldiers who were exchanging information. Uh, that's that get across the lines didn't know or they were not aware. That's correct. That is correct. Yes, sir. Was General Johnston physically near Vicksburg about the time that the whole Johnston will make it to the Big Black River. Uh, he does not cross the Big Black River. Of course, as we referenced last week, the uh, Grant's ex exterior line uh, under Sherman had quite a number of soldiers that were defending against uh, that exact means, trying to prevent Johnston to re from reaching Vicksburg. So Johnston does not uh, even attempt to cross the Big Black. Once he hears the guns are silent, he hears no real engagement, if you will, he knows that Vicksburg has surrendered.